For those of you who are visiting or maybe you've missed recent weeks, the background here is a man named Nehemiah, just an ordinary guy among the people of God who were in exile, who got a burden to rebuild the broken walls around the city of Jerusalem. And he realized he could do something about it. So he went to the Persian king at the risk of his life, and he asked for permission to travel to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls. And the king gave him not just permission, but support. Nehemiah traveled to Jerusalem, pulled everybody together, and over the course of 52 days, despite all kinds of opposition from inside and outside, they rebuilt the entire wall around Jerusalem. That's what the end of Nehemiah 6 tells us. That's where we were last week. And then Nehemiah 7 says, Now when the wall had been built, and I had set up the doors, and the gatekeepers, the singers, and the Levites had been appointed, I gave my brother Hanani, and Hananiah, the governor of the castle, charge over Jerusalem, for he was a more faithful and God-fearing man than many. And I said to them, Let not the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun is hot. And while they are still standing guard, let them shut and bar the doors. Appoint guards from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, some at their guard posts and some in front of their own homes. The city was wide and large, but the people within it were few, and no houses had been rebuilt. Then my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles and the officials and the people to be enrolled by genealogy. And I found the book of the genealogy of those who came up at the first, and I found written in it, These were the people of the province who came up out of the captivity of those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried into exile. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his town. They came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Azariah, Rahamiah, Nahamani, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mishpareth, Bigvi, Nehum, Bahana. The number of the men of the people of Israel, the sons of Perosh, 2,172. The sons of Shephatiah, 372. The sons of Era, 652. The sons of Pahath Moab, namely the sons of Jeshua and Joab, 2,818. The sons of Elam, 1,254. The sons of Zatu, 845. The sons of Zechai, 760. The sons of Benui, 648. The sons of Bibai, 628. The sons of Asgad, 2,322. The sons of Adonikam, 667. The sons of Bigvi, 2,067. The sons of Adon, 655. The sons of Atur, namely of Hezekiah, 98. The sons of Hashem, 328. The sons of Bazai, 324. The sons of Heraph, 112. The sons of Gibeon, 95. The men of Bethlehem and Netapha, 188. The men of Ananoth, Anathoth, 128. The men of Beth Asmapheth, 42. The men of Kiriath Jerem, Kephira, and Beroth, 743. The men of Ramah and Geba, 621. The men of Michmas, 122. The men of Bethel and Ai, 123. The men of the other Nebo, 52. The sons of the other Elam, 1,254. The sons of Haram, 320. The sons of Jericho, 345. The sons of Lod, Hadid, and Ono, 721. The sons of Sinai, 3,930. The priests, the sons of Judea, namely the house of Jeshua, 973. The sons of Immer, 1,052. The sons of Pasher, 1,247. The sons of Haram, 1,017. The Levites, the sons of Jeshua, namely of Cadmiel of the sons of Haudiva, 74. The singers, the sons of Asaph, 148. The gatekeepers, the sons of Shalom, the sons of Atur, the sons of Talman, the sons of Akub, the sons of Hatita, the sons of Shobai, 138. The temple servants, the sons of Ziha, the sons of Hashupah, the sons of Tabaoth, the sons of Keros, the sons of Sia, the sons of Paidan, the sons of Labana, the sons of Hagabah, the sons of Shalmai, the sons of Hanan, the sons of Gidel, the sons of Gehar, the sons of Rehaya, the sons of Rezin, the sons of Nicoda, the sons of Gazim, the sons of Yuza, the sons of Pasea, the sons of Besai, the sons of Meunim, the sons of Nefushimim, Nefushashim, the sons of Bakbuk, the sons of Hakafa, the sons of Harher, the sons of Basleth, the sons of Mehida, the sons of Harsha, the sons of Barkos, the sons of Sisera, the sons of Tima, the sons of Neziah, the sons of Hatifa, 
the sons of Solomon's servants, the sons of Sotai, the sons of Sophereth, the sons of Perida, the sons of Jaela, the sons of Darkon, the sons of Giddel, the sons of Shephathiah, the sons of Hatil, the sons of Pokereth Hazabayim, the sons of Ammon. All the temple servants and the sons of Solomon's servants were 392. The following were those who came up from Telmela, Telharsha, Carib, Adon, and Immer, but they could not prove their father's houses for their descendant, for their descent, whether they belonged to Israel. The sons of Deleah, the sons of Tobiah, the sons of Nakoda, 642. Also of the priests, the sons of Hobeah, the sons of Hakaz, the sons of Barzillai, who had taken a wife of the daughters of Barzillai, the Gileadite, and was called by their name. These sought their registration among those enrolled in the genealogies, but it was not found there, so they were excluded from the priesthood as unclean. The governor told them that they were not to partake of the most holy food until a priest with Urim and Thummim should arise. The whole assembly together was 42,360, besides their male and female servants, of whom there were 7,337, and they had 245 singers, male and female. Their horses were 736, their mules 245, their camels 435, and their donkeys 6,720. Now some of the heads of fathers' houses gave to the work. The governor gave to the treasury 1,000 derricks of gold, 50 basins, 30 priest garments, and 500 minas of silver. And some of the head of fathers' houses gave to the treasury of the work 20,000 derricks of gold and 2,200 minas of silver. And what the rest of the people gave was 20,000 derricks of gold, 2,000 minas of silver, and 67 priest garments. So the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, some of the people, the temple servants, and all Israel lived in their towns. And when the seventh month had come, the people of Israel were in their towns. Whew. I trust you are applauding my attempt to pronounce all of those names correctly. And I trust nobody in this room knows which ones I got accurate or inaccurate. <laughs> Unless you're a Hebrew scholar, in which case you can take it next time. <laughs> did my best. So why did I just spend almost 10 minutes of your life and mine reading all these names and all these numbers? Here's why. Because I want you to hear God saying very clearly to you today through this entire chapter, you matter. Amen. You, right where you're sitting right now, not just the person beside you, or in front of you, behind you, you matter to God. This is clear from the beginning of this chapter in God's word. So verse eight, the sons of Perush, not 2,171 or 2,173, they were 2,172. The sons of Shephatiah, not uh, about 300, 350 of them, approximately 375, no. 372, period. And on and on and on with every single verse. Every single person among the people of God counted. Now there are obviously caveats here. This is only a list of the males, of sons and fathers, as was the cultural custom of that day. And this list in many ways replicates a list of names and numbers that we see back in Ezra chapter two. And some have pointed to minor discrepancies in the list to say one of them's not accurate, but clearly we don't know exactly how this count was taken, potentially updated with more information now years after Ezra chapter two. There's all kinds of discussion and possibilities exactly about exactly how these numbers were counted, but that's kind of the point. They were counted because each person among the people of God counts. So apply this picture from Nehemiah 7 in this gathering, just this gathering today, of God's people in different locations around Metro DC online, because God doesn't just see 
thousands of us listening to this word right now, God sees you. Amen. And you count. You matter. God, we're talking about the sovereign creator and ruler of all things. God sees you. God knows you. God sees and knows every single thing that's going on in your life right now. Every single thing that's on your mind. Every single thing that's in your heart. Sees all your hurts and all your highs and all your lows. And not just you as if you came out of nowhere. You matter and your heritage matters. Your background that has shaped who you are, your family, your home, the place where you were born, your heritage matters to God. This, again, was part of the custom of the day in Nehemiah 7. We see this throughout the Bible, to list people by families or clans or tribes, in part because of the influence that a family had on shaping a person. And not just family, but a village or a town, the place where they were from. Notice Nehemiah 7 lists both family names as well as places, cities, towns, villages, all of which shaped the makeup of each of these individual people in different ways. Each of them with unique stories. And this is true for all of us too. Our backgrounds and our families and our ethnicities and our histories, they all matter. It's the picture, you matter. Your heritage matters. And all this means that what you do with your life matters. Like, do you realize what these names and numbers in Nehemiah 7 represent? They're more than just a listing of people. Like, look back at verse 6. These are the people of the province who came up out of the captivity of those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried into exile. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his town. They came with Zerubbabel. These were the people who decided... Decades before this, not just to put their names on a list, but to lay down their lives on a line to pack up their families, leave Babylon behind, move back to a totally ruined Jerusalem to restore the people of God in the promised land. They were the ones who decided to come back with Zerubbabel and rebuild a nation. They were the pioneers of faith who trusted God and his promises through his prophets that he was going to restore his people in this land. And they sacrificed. They gave of their lives to make that possible. Look at verse 70. Some of the heads of the fathers gave to the work. The governor gave these things, and then some of the heads of the fathers gave into the treasury all this gold and silver. What the rest of the people gave was gold and silver and garments. All of this to help rebuild the temple in the city. That's what the book of Ezra is all about. And then to rebuild the walls around the city, which is what the book of Nehemiah is about. And Nehemiah is listing their names and their numbers. And he's essentially saying to the people of God who had just rebuilt these walls. And I'm going to make this language personal because God in his word is saying the same thing to you right where you are sitting today. One, remember who you are as a child of God. As these walls around Jerusalem had been finished, Nehemiah locks eyes with the people and says, remember who you are as a child of God, as a part of this story that started long before you. And God is saying the same thing to every single person in this gathering who's a follower of Jesus. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, I want to invite you today to become a follower of Jesus. Not, I want to invite you, even as I say that, God desires relationship with you. God loves you so much. In a world of 
Eight billion people, you matter to God. God loves you personally. So much that he, so you, like every single other person in the world, including all of us in this gathering, you have sinned against God. You've turned aside from God and his ways to yourself and your own ways. And your sin separates you from God. And if you die in this state of separation from God, you'll spend eternity separated from God. In judgment, do your sin. But the Good news of the Bible, the greatest news in the world is that God has not left you alone in your sin. God has come to the world in the person of Jesus. And Jesus lived a life of no sin, unlike anybody else. And then, even though he had no sin for which to die, Jesus chose to die on a cross to pay the price for our sins. And then three days later, he rose from the grave in victory over sin and death so that you, so that anyone, anywhere, no matter who you are, no matter what you have done, if you will turn from your sin and trust in Jesus as the Savior, the Lord of your life, God will forgive you of all your sin and restore you to relationship with him now and forever. I invite you, God is inviting you today to Trust in him, begin a relationship with him. What are you waiting for? Your life now and for eternity hinges on this. And when you do, when you place your faith in Jesus and for all who have, you are not just one in a multitude of God's children. Like you count. I only have six kids, but I don't just look at them as a group and think, yeah, I just love you guys as a whole. No, every single one of my kids has such a unique place in my heart. I love each of them so much it hurts. And any parent knows that. Each of them matters so much to me. And I'm an imperfect father. God is a perfect holy, heavenly Father. And he says to each one of his children personally, you matter to me. Your life matters so much to me. God says this about you. What a thought. God says this about you. Do not look to this world to define you. Look to God, your Father, to define you. Realize who you are, not based on what this person or that person or this message or that message in the world says, based on what God, your creator, who loves you and has made you fearfully and wonderfully in his image and desires the best for you. Define yourself based on who he says you are. Remember you, who you are as a child of God. And then remember who has gone before you in the family of God. Yes. Beautiful. What Nehemiah is saying with this list of people in Nehemiah 7, what God is saying to us today, we're in a long line of people who have faithfully walked with God before us. And think about this for a minute. Don't miss this. We've got to see this. This list of people in Nehemiah 7 led to the rebuilding of Jerusalem among God's people which led centuries later to the place where Jesus came and lived and died and rose again, which led to the founding of the church, which led to the spread of the gospel from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and beyond, all the way 2,000 years later to the spread of the gospel to you and me and all the places in the world where we have heard the gospel. Do you realize what this means? Nehemiah chapter seven is our history. This is our heritage. These are the people of God who went before us. This is our story. And then you start thinking about, fast forward to the people of God who have specifically shaped your life and my life, who share the gospel with you and me and our families or in different churches in different countries around the world in this church family. Like this is nothing short of awesome. Do you realize your life is a part of something so much bigger and grander than you are? 
It spans history, generations. So remember who you are. Remember who's gone before you in the family of God. And remember how they've given their lives for the glory of God. And we're a part of a heritage, a family of faith that includes Nehemiah going to a Persian king. And Ezra risking his life. And Zerubbabel and Moses and Abraham and Sarah before them and Peter and John and Mary and Lydia and Paul after them. People who have given their lives to pass the gospel on from generation to generation. Who've faithfully walked with God, including people in our lives who have walked with God and passed the gospel on to us. So in light of who you are, in light of the heritage of people who have given their lives for the glory of God. Nehemiah was saying then, and God is saying to you and me today, resolve to continue the work of God in the time and place in which you are living. In Nehemiah 7, God had not brought back these people, these families, to sit back and settle into their villages while the city of Jerusalem lay in ruins. So in the same way, I ask you, has God brought you to this time and place in the history of his people for you to sit back in casual, comfortable, cultural, routine religion while you just watch him work as a spectator in the world? Is that God's design for your life? No way. You were created for so much more than Amen. that. You're a child of God. Amen. You're a unique, you are, not just other people. Like You are a unique and significant part of the people of God. Which means you have a unique and significant part to play in the building up of his kingdom in the world. Yes. Do you realize why you're here in this time and place? Yes. Not to coast through casual, comfortable, routine religion until you get to heaven. No, don't settle for that. You're, you're a part of a coming kingdom. You have the greatest news in the world. You have the Holy Spirit of God in your heart. You're a child of God. So to use our question from this entire series, what could God do if every single person among his people said, just like Nehemiah said and scores of other people named and numbered said, I'm gonna play my part in the work of God in my day. I'm gonna give my resources. I'm gonna spend my life building up God's people and advancing God's kingdom in the world in my day. And do we realize the time and place in which we are living? Like there are more people alive today in the world who have never heard the gospel than ever before in history. We talk about this all the time. Over three billion people unreached by the gospel today. And you and I, in this time, in this place, have more opportunities to reach them with the gospel than ever before in history. Never before have been able, people, people have been able to travel like we can, had technology like we have, globalization of the marketplace, unprecedented wealth in the history of the world. The opportunities we have, praise God. This week, I heard about Samuel and Sierra who took a job, members of our church took a job through the government in Southeast Asia, specifically so that they could go spread the gospel among people who've never heard the name of Jesus in Southeast Asia. Samuel just preached his first sermon in a church there this last week. Yes. Do you see it? You matter. Whether you're in Metro Washington, D.C. or Southeast Asia, you matter. And you have a part to play in the advancement of God's kingdom in the world through your gifts, your skills, your job, your school, your education, your resources. Do not buy the lie of the adversary that you're just kind of on the sidelines and other people are doing the real work in the kingdom of God. That is not from God. That is the evil one saying that to you. Don't sell God short what he's created you for. Especially here for us in the capital of the United States. 
in a church filled with people from all kinds of nations, the opportunities we have to spread the gospel among the nations in this unique city and from this unique city to the ends of the earth, what could God do if every single person in this church family from 10 years old to 90 years old and everywhere in between, from every single background said, I want my life to count. Amen. This, is, this is what God is saying to us through this passage that we would normally just kind of glaze over it when we read through the Bible. God is saying, you count, you matter. And as you hear him saying that to you, God's calling us to say, and I want to make my life count. With a little bit of breath that I have, this mist of a life, vapor that's here one second, gone the next, I want to make it count to do all that you're calling me to do in this world.